What amazing promises we have that God's eyes are upon us today. That He cares for us. That He loves us. Last week, we started from a universal view of families and we talked about the prodigal family as opposed to the prodigal son. How in fact we've all wandered from God. How in fact God was proactive in calling us back by the power of the Holy Spirit to have a close intimate relationship with Him. Today we're going to go from that view down to the view of the family level to see how we might strengthen our individual families. Let's pray together as we do so. Father in heaven, we come humbly before your throne of grace this morning to worship you. We ask, Lord, that as we open our hearts and our lives to you, that you will speak to our minds, pour into our minds the wisdom, Father, and the knowledge, that you will speak to our hearts, that your spirit will fill our hearts with love that you will bless us individually and bless our families that are represented here. We ask in Christ's precious name, amen. When we think of families, our minds automatically sort of check out in one of two directions. Oh no, he's going to go to meddling. Or, oh no, I probably have heard it before. So let me ask you a couple of questions as we begin. What is your view of family? Just when I say that word. How many of you here today can remember the black and white version of I Love Lucy? Oh, some of you do, and some of you probably have gotten in on the color-enhanced versions that might be shown. How about how many remember Ozzie and Harriet? Quite a few. How about Leave it to Beaver? Quite a few. How about All in the Family? That's even more. How about The Simpsons? Little different generation? How about modern family? Oh, we've got a wide cross-section historically of what society tells us and portrays to us might be a reflection of the contemporary family. We used to use the term family to uh, be representative of what we would classically call the nuclear family. That is, husband and wife and children. There's only one problem with that definition. It is a family that exists only among, uh, only among larger portions that are not reflective of the nuclear family. Let me explain thusly. In one of the latest census, and I'm going to use family and households, sort of interchangeably today. Family and households, sort of interchangeably. In one of the latest census, national census, it was determined that the family that would contain typical Joe or average Joe and average Jane is made up of a different assortment than those families of the past. For in fact, 28.7% of the households represented were married with no children. And that was the largest group. Followed immediately by 25% of the households that were singles. Some with children, some without children. The largest portion of those, not the largest, but the largest growing portion, were the 10.7% of males that are heads of households there. 24.7% one percent of the households were nuclear families in the classical sense married or otherwise with children the remaining percentage 
um, had household, households made up of families and non-families. The definition of households and families has radically changed in just a few decades. So where do you fall in that mixture? Perhaps you're part of that group that has gone from married with children to empty nesters. Perhaps you're part of that group that are married without children. Perhaps you have a household that's a single household. Perhaps you're part of that um, nuclear, and that, that word nuclear can be used in many, many different forms and fashions, <laughs> a nuclear family with children that occasionally gets uh, chaotic, and if you were to use the word in a different fashion, maybe a little heated and explosive as well, a little play on words there. But families take on a little different meaning. But God loves our families so much. And he wants our families to thrive. Because as the family is, so is the church. As the church is, so is the community. As the community is, so is the world. Do you believe that, friends? So it starts with us as individuals. It starts with us connecting as families with God. And the influence it pervade, it, His influence pervades beyond that. So let me ask you a, que a, a secondary question. How well do you think society is doing in its view of God in faith, in Him, in faith, in our families? Barnard Research took a poll and explored what does society consider, how does society consider a view of, let me roll that around again and start that over. Barnard Research polled people and said, what do you believe is a biblical worldview? And they polled society at large and said, here is our definition of a biblical worldview. And here it is with six points. And I just asked this question today. Where do you fall in the biblical worldview? For purposes of the survey, a biblical worldview was defined as believing that, number one, absolute moral truth does exist. Absolute moral truth does exist. Exist. Number two, the Bible is totally accurate in all of the principles it teaches. Number three, Satan is considered to be a real being or force, not merely symbolic. Number four, a person cannot earn their way into heaven trying to be good or do good works. Number five, Jesus Christ lived a sinful life on earth, and God is all-knowing, all-powerful creator of this world who still rules the universe today. That is a simple six-point definition of world view. One could think, or one could hope, that the vast majority of Christianity and society today would embrace that simple six point, that simple six point expression of a biblical world view. 2005, Barnard Research reported only 9% of the population would say that they believed in a biblical world view. Rather, 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 uh, rather hard to fully understand the implications when only 9% of society says that there is a biblical worldview. Far more startling to me was the fact that the mosaics, a subset uh, in age range of 18 to 23, were filtered out. That is the next generation. One would hope 
that that subset of this larger poll would be larger than the 9%. That subset ran one half of 1% would say that they agreed with a biblical world view. Our families, there's a lot of work to do within our families, spiritually, when we think about our relationship with God because the family unit is the strongest and most influential, spiritual, spiritually speaking, upon the children and the next generation. Moving that from a half a percent to 10 percent to 20 percent to changing our families, to changing our community, to changing the world for Christ. Today we're going to look at some things from a biblical standpoint that will strengthen our family, our families. One definition of family that I read this week was our family is a circle of strength founded on faith joined in love, kept together by God, both now and forever. Do you like that definition? Our family is a circle of strength, founded on faith, joined in love, kept by God, together now and forever. So some of the things I'm just going to ask you to reflect upon your household and your family this morning as we look at some biblical things as laid out in Scripture that might strengthen our families. You may be fully embracing each of these, and you may say, I need to reflect a little bit and engage in a more intentional way with some of the things that are uh, given to us in Scripture that will strengthen our family. The first is strengthening our commitment a Christian family has a strong commitment to each other. They have an, what I call and has been labeled an illogical commitment to each other. An illogical commitment. You see, there are things in life that just are logical. One, two, three, what's next? Four. Why is it I like ice cream as one of my favorite foods and my wife likes avocados? After 273 weeks together, that hasn't changed much. Why is it that you are so logical in so many things and so illogical in other things? We are fearfully and wonderfully made, aren't we? Because this thing called love isn't always logical, is it? I mean, it has a root in lo uh, it has a basis to logic. I like and love my wife, and at times I'm so logical in other areas, if I could only get her to understand the way I think and operate, things would, wait a minute, I guess I got that backwards. If I would only understand how she operates, things in the house would be better. 273 weeks, most of those weeks have been very good. There's been mostly sunshine, a few weeks of rain. But that's the way it works in relationships. But in the relationship of family dynamics, there's just something that transcends logic when a family says that no matter what happens to our family, we're going to get through it. We're going to see through the immediacy of the presenting, the presenting problem and the presenting issue. We're going to step back and cool things down a little bit and realize that in spite of the presenting issue, we know as a family we're going to make it. We're going to make it through the good times, praise the Lord, and we're going to make it through the difficult times, praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, you're still with me. So, First uh, John chapter 3, verse 11. You may jot, jot the reference down, you can read it this afternoon. For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should what? Love one another. 
And love at times is very logical, and at other times, we just love because we love. And that's what we're called to do. When things are good, we love it all the more. When things are not so good, we should apply a double portion of love. Our families not only need to have that love, our families, the second thing is our families must be families of faith. The guiding factor in the Christian home is faith. There's a gyroscope that balances the family of faith, and it's called the Scriptures. Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will what? We will serve the Lord. That's a different gyroscope as the gyroscope that the world would put upon you. If you want to get ahead and have a happy home, and your faith is not based in Scripture. It may be where we can attain to in social status. It may be how high can we ascend. We might judge our success as a family by what kind of car we drive, our social settings, who we network with. All of that can be taken from us. But when we base our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will serve today who we will serve. We will choose today who we will serve. And as for me and my family, we will serve who? We will serve the Lord. The gyroscope and guiding faith for the Christian family to be strong is a faith that's based in Scripture. Strengthening faith in our families means building our houses upon the rock, our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 127, verse 1. We read, Except the Lord builds a house, they that build it buildeth in vain. Except the Lord keeps a city, the watchman, the watchman waketh but in vain. Except the Lord builds a house, they that build it, the Scripture says, they build it what? In vain. At best, keeping a household together, at best, keeping a family together is good. At worst, it's really difficult. And if we're trying to build our families on something other than the foundation of the Lord, it's being done in vain. The wise man, the scripture says, builds his house upon what? The rock. Rather than the sand, when the storms, of, uh, the storms come, the storms of life come, and the waves come crashing upon the sand, the foundation gets washed away. The foundation for the family is a foundation of building our families on the Lord Jesus Christ. What will help our families grow and flourish with the Lord Jesus Christ? I believe our families must be places of caring, of uh, a caring family and loving family, affirming one another with words of kindness. First uh, Thessalonians chapter five verse eleven says, "Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. Wherefore, gather together in the family circle, spend time over a family meal. So so much has been stripped away so subtly, so quickly." as if it's the new norm not to do something like this. Take time to have a meal together, more than once a week. The meal today is, we'd like uh, two super burritos to go, and four lar extra large Cokes, and by the way, three sweet desserts to go. And two minutes in, two minutes out, and on the way home, We've digested a meal or in between running here and there. We've lost, we've lost to our detriment the beauty of gathering around the table and sharing what's happened. If you will ask that question, just ask that question. Tell me what's happened in your life today or last week or the good things, or the not so good things. And if you'll just listen, it doesn't matter whether it's a bowl of soup a two-course meal, something that, uh, gentlemen, you prepared because she's been so busy out of the fridge into the microwave. It's just gathering around the table and affirming and supporting 
one another. There's the other aspect of caring, um, of building strong families, and that's respecting each other uh, in the family. Respecting each other, regardless of age, regardless of where you are in the family. Hebrews 2, verse 9 says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which, which corrects us. We gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live, that being our Heavenly Father, and sharing respect for our, with our children, our spouses, that respect for each other uh, is shared in the family, which results in trusting relationships. For when in the family we manifest the characteristics that God extends to us, the family becomes a safe place where we can share the troubles and trials and tribulations. Psalm 20 verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember... Do you remember the rest of that verse? Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. While others look to other places to trust, for me in my house, we will remember the name of the Lord our God, and we will trust, place our trust in Him. How do you strengthen the family? You strengthen the family by strengthening your relationships with the Father. Healthy, strong families spend time together, communicating and listening, just talking and listening to one another. When's the last time you made a bag of popcorn, got in your easy chair and said, come here, son, come here, daughter. Let's spend Friday evening and close the week and enter into the Sabbath together. Oh, we occasionally do that as a church fan. What's that called? Breakfast for what? Oh, that's right, the first Sabbath of the month. If you want to come by, bring a little uh, something, rolls, donuts, breakfast or supper, roughly 6 o'clock, come a little later. We have anywhere for a dozen to 25. And cease from the secular, slip into the sacred. Healthy families communicate, talk, and listen. Speaking the truth in love, to one another. Ephesians 5 verse 15, 415 says, let our words be spoken in love and goodness and grace. It's in the family that our children learn the morals and values at a ver very early age. By example, more than proclamation. It's amazing how those little eyes see everything, isn't it? It's amazing how those little ears Hear things, both good and some things that we wish we could roll back once out into the air, never to be taken back. It's amazing how morals and values are taught by observation. How, how many of you here grew up in a Christian home? How many of you had... Good, oh, I will ask it as a rhetorical question. How many of you had good, uh, good examples in mothers and fathers who role modeled what Christianity was all about? It seems there's been a bit of disconnect. Somewhere the connection of modeling, if only point, point five percent of the Mosaic generation says that they believe in a worldview somewhere there's a huge disconnect in modeling and sharing what a biblical family might or could or should look like. Would you say amen? So what do we do? What do we do? We have responsibilities. We have responsibilities to our children as mothers and fathers. We have responsibility to our children as a church family to portray to them and provide them a safe environment, to be examples 
of tangible love to them. You see, it's really not about mom getting her way or dad getting his way. For the fact of the matter is, uh, one startling statistic is of of the marriages happening today, of the marriages happening today, 52%, only 52% will last more than a few years. Of the marriages today, 40% are second marriages. What does that mean? We have such blended families. That means in, uh, in selection of a spouse and a mate that you're going to unite your life with for the rest of your life. Be careful. Make sure that your spiritual values are similar to his or hers. Make sure that you're looking beyond today and next week. What are their commitments to faith? What are their commitments to living a Christian life? Role modeling to children and blended families is harder today than it's ever been. But let me say, let me say this, when the storms of life come, as they will, as they will at some time in your life, it's at that time, you, it's at that time, it takes a little bit of stepping back and saying, what are families all about anyway? What are families all about anyway? So I step back just seven days in the past. And last week we learned what our family's all about anyway. That God sent His only begotten Son to proactively die on the cross for His family, which is you and me. He role modeled to us what family is all about. And it's about the children in the family. Isn't that true? You see, as adults, we pretty quick polarize. I'm right. By implication, you're wrong. It has to be my way, by implication. There is no other way. It has to be my way, or it'll be no way. And what do children learn? Divisiveness, isolationness, selfishness. And God has called us to role model to them a pathway of learning to understand people who are so much different than we are. That is the other people in our own household. Because I don't know any two people, husband and wife, that have the perfect marriage. Good marriages, yes. Strong marriages, yes. Marriages that go on the rocks, for a few hours, a few days, a few weeks, a season or two? Yes. But marriages that God can work through, not for the sake of mom and dad, but for the sake of the children. If He could send His only begotten Son to die on the cross, can't we die to self for the sake of the children? The home is to be a place, if we're going to strengthen the home today, a place of privacy, a place of space and time where each individual can receive strength from one another with the full realization that each family is unique and each person is unique. So how can this ever, ha how can this ever happen? when we realize such a task before us. I'll have to say, it's beyond my doing. I have lit up more family arguments in my family than I care to admit to. I've actually apologized for part or most of them. 
and the rest I'll finish up today and say, I'm sorry, dear. I have carried my selfishness to degrees that I would never want to be known public, but God sees everything in my heart. So there's no place to go except to Him. So how do we bring all this meandering together? It's a wonderful thing to, to hear, Pastor, that we need to have strong spiritual families. I'm going to suggest to you there's really only one way that we can have the families that God wants us to have. That's to be part of His family and to receive His blessing. So I'm going to ask you today, I'm going to share with you a blessing that comes from Ephesians, Paul's writings. I'm going to ask you today, you're here roughly clustered by households. At least I hope you're probably sitting in the same aisle as somebody in your household. Occasionally, you might be sitting opposite sides of the church. But I'd ask you to just take your spouse's hand if they're close. Now we have to do this with the full realization that marrieds are really only half of our congregation. If you heard the statistics, right? Half, a quarter, married, no children. A quarter, married, singles, not <laughs> Try that again. <laughs> Over a quarter, married, no children in the home. Over a quarter, heads of household are single. Uh, a quarter, typical nu nuclear family. And a quarter, something else making up the household. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, if a family member is next to you, take their, take their hand. And then I'm going to ask you to slide one way or the other in the pew, one way or the other, it's okay, and grab hold either of another family, another family, or maybe somebody who's just here representing a family or a single person. So grab a hold of hands, slide together. And then I'm going to ask you, as you're holding hands, just in, in your pew, slip forward down on your knees with me. And I'm going to share a prayer blessing from Ephesians chapter 3. Father, we live in a world that presses in upon our families in so many different ways to discourage and distract. But Father, today we know that families, families matter to you. So we would ask, Father, that you would bless the families and households represented here. And as Paul proclaimed in Ephesians 3.14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto Him, that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think 
according to power that works in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus through all the ages, world without end. Amen. Amen.